everybody. You know, one of the things we're going to do today is really talk about Leadership Starts Here, which is actually the name of the book that I just finished writing that went off to the editor on Monday. So, and uh, so that's a big breakthrough. But, it, you know, the fundamentals are really what we're going to be talking about today. You know, where does leadership really start? So I offer you the opportunity to do two things. One, to make this as interactive as you'd like. Feel free to dive in. You can do it in the chat. You can just speak up. You know, this is really meant to cover a lot about leadership decision making. So with that in mind, let's just dive right in here. I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint. And uh, we're going to dive right in here. Actually, especially if we start at the right place here, this is good. So leadership starts here is really what the story is. And my basic premise, leadership starts, and this is a really good question. Many of you have heard me speak before, but leadership starts with the decisions you make. And if you're not making good decisions, nothing else that you're doing is quite gonna work very well at all. So let's talk about what that means and uh, dig right in here. So my intentions for today are the same as they always are. Perspectives, principles, and processes for decision-making. One of the most important issues I want to really emphasize that point about process because most of the time, many people don't have a very clear process for doing what they're doing. They can find ways to intuit or have a, you know, a sense of a habit or experience to come up with answers, but rarely do they have a clear, coherent process. And from the point of view of leadership, lack of process usually means you have lack of alignment. Let's talk about how that starts to show up. And, you know, the reason you care is because you don't have good process, good principles, and good perspectives, your chances of success are pretty minuscule. So I want to just do one thing right here. Just uh, how many of you have heard this uh, presentation before? Any, anything like this before? Because we've been talking about decision making for a long time here in the Leadership Effectiveness Council. And one of I've the things some of your presentations before. All right, you have. So you understand the power of process, but also the focus on decision making. And this is one of the key issues that we want to really pay attention to because the issue of how do we get where we need to go with our organization is one of the most important issues that we face every day and every time. And from a leadership point of view, my issue that I want to share with you is how do you reach the point of maximum efficiency and effectiveness of moving an organization forward? That's really what I'm interested in, what I want to share with you today. And we'll get you the right slide here. Okay, we're falling behind. How many people love Zoom? <laughs> you know, it's amazing yeah, what can be done easy. though, I gotta say. So let's it's a good. It's a good tool, Steve. Uh, I think it's the uh, best of breed right now. Well, it's interesting because, you know, you'll see one of my axioms in just a little while, but I call it uh, clarity of outcome and quality of process produces outstanding results. We just had a 10 hour Zoom meeting that we ran through what we call the strategic alignment process with a team. And they were so energized at the end, they didn't want to stop. But, you know, a little bit of quick inspiration, you know, especially Ben Franklin, you think about that in the context of what happened in our government yesterday. And it's pretty fascinating. Clarity is power, especially clarity about what's most important. And this is what we're going to be aiming at. What's most important is really sort of the central theme for everything we do. You know, what do you think it does? I mean, this is a really interesting question because when I ask my clients, where does leadership start? Most of them have no clue and they're all over the board. Hiring good talent, execution, all of which are good answers, but it's not where it starts. And if you don't start from a good place, where you start is a predisposition for where you're going to end up. So where you start is a predisposition for the trajectory you're going to be on and where you're going to end up. And if you don't start with decision making and decision making process, you're starting with a, a really immature and inadequate process that could cost you. So I'm going to ask you to think about this as we go forward and feel free again we can do this as interactively as you want i've got plenty to say but i find interaction is even more exciting what is your process and it's really useful to think about i want to tip, tip my hat to steve shapiro because he's got process for thinking through questions and designing innovation if you haven't read his book i keep <laughs> steve i don't know how many of your books i've sold for you but I think it's one of the best books. And again, there's a clear set of processes to execute on. 
but what's your decision-making process for your most important decisions? Let's not just talk about in general, but what are your most important decisions? And I'm gonna suggest that you learn from your own experience. So here's what I want you to do for just a moment here. What were some of your best and most successful decisions? The things that drove your success in ways more, more than normal. And this is a pretty successful group here. Certainly the ones I know, but also what are your most challenging and difficult to, to decisions? And really more importantly, what's the difference from them? And what do you want today? So anybody want to put uh, in the chat or speak to what would you like to get from today? You came here, this you're investing your most valuable commodity, which is your time. What would you like from today? My, my, my reason for today is that anything that I hear from you, they are words of wisdom. And <laughs> definitely there is a saying, perfection is gained by experience. And I certainly see that in you. And I've read some of your stuff and those are awesome. Because there is one thing, like there is never an end to a learning. And if at all we think, we know that's the end of it. So I'm really intrigued by your presentation and that is the reason why I'm here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dave, you're too kind. You know, I think it was John Kennedy who said, leaders are learners. John Kennedy did say that, Steve. And uh, hello, by the way. And well, it's uh, good to see you. Likewise, likewise. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you the two things I'm looking for. Uh, one is uh, something new. And Got it and or innovative, something I haven't been exposed to before, or validation that what I'm currently doing is on course, on track, uh, or um, uh, validate you stop doing something that I'm doing. Actually, so first of all, that's actually a brilliant input, Bob. And uh, knowing that you come from a very high level of understanding leadership too looking for what's new that can give you new perspectives, principles, and practices, as well as understanding better process is a good way to go. But uh, I just remember my first Fortune 500 client, which was a long time ago, I had hair back then. No, that's actually not true, but uh, you know, and I asked this, one of the finest leaders I've ever met, I said, what do you wanna work on? He said, you know, we're successful right now and I can't tell you why. And I wanna figure it out before we're not successful. And it's actually a pretty brilliant perspective, you know, to say, how do I know if what I'm doing is fundamentally sound, if it makes sense, and what else can I see, hear, understand, and put into practice? So brilliant perspective from a, you know, another fine leader here. Anybody else? And I promise you results on both sides, Bob. Okay, good, good. <laughs> to me, it's always hearing somebody's point of view that may make me look at where I'm at in a different way. It's that different perspective that really does add a clarity to, uh, it says the fresh set of eyes. Yeah, now Susan, again, you know, a wise point of view there, because there's two ways in which you make fundamental change in the world. One is you change your perspectives and how you think about something, and the other is you change your procedures of what you're doing. The real challenge in changing procedures is your point of view, your mindset, your perspective, <laughs> usually defines what your capabilities for change, for action are really going to be. So, uh, you know, the greatest impediment to change is habits. The best thing you can do to, to uh, really view your habits is to get different perspectives on them. Anybody else want to jump in? And yeah, so Steve, uh, a lot of the stuff that you uh, talk about in these sessions, I feel that uh, I innately understand and uh, do when I'm leading teams. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not uh, as effective as I'd like to be uh, to articulate it up front and to be able to say ahead of time um, what the concepts are that I want the team to understand and go by. So I'm attending these sessions uh, to bring my own leadership capabilities and communication abilities uh, up a level by uh, listening to you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, because if I can reinterpret what you're saying, Steve, you know, what I hear is that, uh, you know, you know what you're doing. It's just hard to explain to others what it is, which is pretty <laughs> typical of most of us, you know, that through our practice, through our experience, through our intelligence, through our life, you know, we've learned how to do certain things, just we do it intuitively or, you know, habitually or 
just from experience, but when you're needing to really coach, teach, train, or engage others, you know, having clear principles that make sense. One of my favorite sayings, we don't have it in the slides today, but uh, everybody knows the old 80-20 rule. I have a new 80-20 rule. It goes like this, 80% of success is common sense. Less than 20% of the people are using it. So what we're trying to do here is produce common sense. And the best common sense is really universal principles. You know, W. Edwards Deming had something he called profound knowledge, and it consisted of three things. Number one, they're very simple principles. Number two, they're universal principles. And number three, the application of the principle produces a profound increase in the quality of the results. That's what he called profound knowledge. And that's what I see here too. And Steve, what I think you're talking about is, you know, unlike most consultants who uh, thrive on the double axis grid and great models and experiences and examples and, you know, things that are really contextually or situationally oriented, what we're really looking for in this process is what's universal that could be applied anywhere in the world to any human being because it's transcultural. So I think that's always a great quest. And what I'm always looking to do is to say, is this applicable 100% of the time? If it is, we're probably in a good space. If it's not, we need to refine a little more. It doesn't mean it's not useful. So thank you for that. Anybody else? Actually, I'll, I'll jump in. I have a slightly different objective here underneath the C-suite sequoia tree uh, <laughs> metaphor. Uh, I've always, you know, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, but I've not been able to articulate the work you do. And so to me, one of the big benefits of the, the C-suite is being able to recommend other people. And I'm here today to actually better understand what you do so I can recommend you to my clients when it's an appropriate situation. So that's why I'm here. Well, Steve, thank you. I'm honored. And of course, you know, I have the highest regard for your work. So again, this is, you know, it's really a pleasure when you get together a really high level group here and, uh, you know, we're recording this. So feel free to you know, get the recording. So we start to look at what I call ultimate business leadership. You know, Steve, to your point, I've thought long and hard about what are the core aspects. There's a fourth circle that I don't have here because that's what everybody brings here to this, to this particular practice, which is your skill, your technical expertise. But outside of technical expertise that you have, you know, what do we need to be able to do? Deliver client value. And client can be anybody who affects the outcome of your business. You also need to have what I call strategic alignment. Are we aligned around our vision, mission, goals, and strategies? You'll see more about that because if you don't have that kind of alignment, your capability for leadership impact is reduced significantly. And then the issue of leading change is not something that we do occasionally on a project basis. We do all the time today. And let's talk about last year as a great example of that. If you weren't capable of leading change, not managing change, I don't believe change can be managed and you're gonna be in trouble. And when you start to look at the intersections of these key practices, you start to look at where's maximum business impact that we're clear and focused on our vision, mission, goals that deliver maximum value to our clients, that innovation comes from the capability to lead change in conjunction with delivering maximum value. And again, the clients could be internal, external. It doesn't just mean the people writing checks, but innovation comes when you need to deliver value and you also need to do it in the midst of change. And I'll, I'll leave it to Steve Shapiro to validate that one. Uh, strategic alignment, are we on the right track, vision, mission, goals? And are we able to change as needed? That's where high performance shows up. And what this all comes together to really produce in the center is ultimate business leadership. So just so you know, if you want a copy of the slides, just info at optimizeintl.com. Just put in the subject line leadership council slides. You don't need to do anything else. I'm more than delighted to share this with you. So here's the simple questions. You know, what is most important? You'll see that from me all the time because what is most important, WIMI, is what I call the most important question every time, everywhere, in every situation. What is most important is what is most important. So here's a couple of the things, and I'm just going to talk about a few of these as I bring them up. But uh, you know, what's most important for organizational success? A compelling vision of the future to me is one of the most important things. There's an old Japanese proverb that says, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. You know, we've got to go all the way down to vision. We've got to have clarity and focus on the most valuable results. And we're going to show you something about what happens when this is not there. So these are the basics that drive a great organization, all of these different things, the mission, the strategies, the execution, the talent, 
the client focus, because I'll tell you what, so many companies have great ideas without a client focus and they drive themselves into the ground. And again, you know, ultimately one of the most important aspects of any work is the culture that you live in, that you breed, that you produce in your organization. You produce it either consciously, you produce it unconsciously, but culture is a live aspect of every organization, whether it's a small family, a small team or a giant organization. So let's talk about how we get these things here. So here's a dirty dozen uh, of issues resulting from poor decision-making process. And just, I'm gonna to talk to a couple of these. Lack of engagement, you know, 70%, the Gallup organization claims that 70% of Americans are disengaged at work. And I don't think they did any surveys during last year. So I can only imagine it may be higher. You know, so we have lack of leadership effectiveness is one of the <clears throat> issues that poor decision making process produces. We have a lack of priorities. We have a lack of collaboration and cooperation. We have a lack of trust and a lack of consistent improvement. And we have a lack of an agreed upon coordinated path forward. This is where you find people running around in circles. Any other favorites from anybody? These are the issues that result from poor decision making process. And this is just a set of them. I'm going to show you. Here's the other point. So these are the issues. Here's some of the causes. And I actually articulate 35 of them in my book. But I'm just going to bring you a dozen of them, a dirty dozen. So it'll be 13 of them. But you know, one of the most significant ones is prioritizing activity over results. I find more of my leaders fail, suffer, and struggle from doing too many things than from doing a few things exceptionally well that really matter. And one of the biggest conversations that goes on virtually every coaching session is, what are your top priorities? And either they don't have them or they're not focused on them, they're not communicating them, they're not addressing them. It's too easy, you know, one of my favorite uh, tasks that I give one of my leaders is what I call the 50 choices dilemma. You know, you ask a, a CEO or a C-suite leader, you have 50 things to do in a day. For a lot of leaders, that's a good day. I'm going to give them two choices. You do priorities number one, two, and three, never touch the other 47, or you do priorities four to 50, never touch number one, two, and three. What's your choice? Now, everybody knows what the appropriate choice is, but that's not the appropriate practice that's usually executed in most organizations. Most people are working on 47 priorities over the top three. There's the old Warren Buffett story. He has five priorities at any given time. If it's not one of those five priorities being addressed by a request or a task, he doesn't do it. And I'd say he's a good model for effectiveness. So, you know, one of the other key issues that cause poor decision-making process is we don't have agreement. And in a different sense, we don't have alignment on the important priorities. Sometimes we're stating what they are, but we're not getting agreement and we're not getting everybody focused and in tune and in harmony and in alignment with those priorities. So the demand for activity and the demand for speed generally prioritizes activity over smart decision making. And being busy is hardly a sign of being successful. So there's no coherent decision making process to me is one of the first things I note. So when I go into an organization, I offer to say, I can tell you how strategically aligned your organization is in less than 30 minutes. If you give me five minutes each with your top five people, I'm gonna ask them three questions. The questions are, what's your vision? What's your mission? What are your top three strategic objectives? If you don't get the same answer from your top five people in your organization, you can only imagine what the rest of your organization looks like because most of that means you're gonna have very siloed organization doing many different things. You know how many times I've gotten the same answer from five senior executives of an organization to those three simple basic questions? Susan's shaking her head because you know the answer, right? The answer is it's never happened. Never, ever happened. And we're talking about some high performing organizations. You can only imagine what they could be doing if they were in agreement and alignment on the three most fundamental decisions that any organization needs to make. So this is what we look to address. Any other favorites, folks? These are causes. These are just 12 of my favorites from the 35 that I've identified. Let's continue on. You have to step in. So here's the most basic questions, because when I'm working with an organization, you know, Steve, I mean, to your point, there's a lot of great ideas, but they can only absorb so much. Let's make sure they absorb the most critical ones. There's three fundamental questions that transform everything in an organization. And if they're answered well and they're answered appropriately, 
you can really drive tremendous focus alignment and execution in an organization. First question is, what are our most important results? Not our to-do list, but what are our most important results? The second question, which goes right along with it, is how can you validate that? Why are these the best choices of what's most important? Bob, to your point in your service, you know, I understand that the military doesn't take on activity unless there's a clear mission. And a clarity of mission is one of the best explanations for why we're doing something. If you can't explain why it's a good choice, it's probably not. So if you can't get an answer to these two questions, first and foremost, you're probably driving yourself around in circles or into a hole. And I think it's that simple with senior leaders. Can you say, what are your most important results? Give me your three most important results. Tell me why those are the best choices of what's most important. Because then, and only then, are you ready to ask the question, how do we accomplish these? And it's amazing, I call it premature action, premature strategy, but it's amazing how many organizations can tell you about 12 strategies they're executing, but they can't tell you what the objectives that are most important to the organization are, and they can't tell you why they're choosing those objectives or those strategies other than they seem like the best ones that they can accomplish. So here's the key that we wanna to cover today. What's the process for making it happen? Everybody in favor say aye. All right. Okay. All right. Good. We'll carry. We'll continue on here. So I want to offer to you the structure and process for effective decision making for leaders. And this is one of the simplest formats. And I'll get into more process points for you. I want to show you today about seven different processes that you can use to improve your thinking, your decision making at any given time. Here's the mother of all of them from a leadership point of view. And I call this the strategic alignment process. So first of all, when I talk about internal, when you're talking about an individual, because what is an organization other than a collection of individuals in relationship with each other? So as an individual, as a person, you know who you are, what you value, what you believe is possible, and what your rules of engagement are, define how your nervous system works. In an organizational sense, these points define what your culture is like. So your culture is based on your beliefs and a lot of these are very unconscious. I want to be really clear in an organization. Who you are, what you value, what you believe is possible, and the rules of engagement. The higher up you operate, the more effective you're going to be. Too many organizations are operationalized by the rules of the organization. Rules are the lowest level of compliance you could possibly have. The values of an organization is a transcendent level of engagement. And the organizations that are values driven and know who they are are the most powerful. What's interesting and what's one of the pieces that we add that really is the basis of the book is that these are actually the driving forces of the most important decisions that organizations and leaders need to make. But if you don't have these clear, you don't have a foundation for the other critical decisions or I call the external decisions, the decisions, the choices that need to be made. So one point to be pointed out here is that even if you're not clear about who you are as an organization or what you value or what you believe needs to happen or is possible or the rules of, org of operation, you still have these operationalized within your organization, but then they're unconscious. And unconscious activities tend to lead to very unconscious results. So the more clear you are in your culture about who we are, what we value, what we believe is possible when we operate at our best and what are our rules for engagement to achieve what we care about, the more clear your people will be able to act consistent with being able to make these decisions about why are we here? What's our mission? What are our goals? What are our strategies? And guess what? The identity and values, the purpose and mission answer the question of why we're doing what we're doing. Our beliefs about what's possible and our goals answer the question about what really is worth doing. And our rules and our strategies identify how we're going to do it. Here's the interesting piece. So many companies have very, very poor visions. When I did research for the book, I was looking for vision statements from major corporations. There's hundreds on the line, uh, if you go online. And of the hundreds that I pulled up, about 300, there were probably about 15 really good ones that qualified as what I call a vision. Because a vision is really a picture of the future where you fully manifested who you are, why you're here, and what you really value. So this is what a vision is, a picture of the future. And whether that future is one year, three years, five years, 10 years, a generation, 
you know, you choose your time frame, but what would the future look like if we fully manifested our identity, our purpose, our values? And if you get those three aspects clear, creating a vision is very simple and it's very, very effective. Most visions are really goals or, or strategies. I once had the opportunity, one of my clients, I got a chance to work with leadership development in the organization. They set up a meeting with the CEO. And this is one of the classic stories of lack of vision. I sat down with the CEO and I said, what's your vision for the organization? He primped himself up and he goes, we're gonna be a $3 billion company in three years. And I looked at him and said something nobody had ever said to him before, which is, and I bet your people are really excited about coming to work every day. <laughs> and he looks at me because nobody had ever said that to him before. He said, what do you mean? I said, in no way, shape or form is that a vision. At best, it's a goal. Maybe it's just a strategy. But a vision well done is a compelling reason why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing, and why we're engaged and committed. And you're telling your people you're working for the glory of you and the board of directors and the stockholders. So there's no vision in that. And I think it was a wake up call for him because he started working on that. But basically, we're going to be a $3 billion company in three years at best is a goal. And likely it's more of a strategy. Why would you want to be a $3 billion company in three years? But you start to look at the qualities that it takes to really be on purpose in consistency with your mission and in a vision sense. And you realize that most of what passes for vision and mission, even some of the finest companies and the largest companies in the world really make no sense whatsoever. You know, they're basically strategies dressed up to be called a mission so they can post it on the wall. That's not what we call effectiveness. So decision-making axioms, here's some of my favorites. And when I talk about an axiom, Steve, to your point about how do I explain these things? I think most of these usually fall in the category called common sense, really relevant universal common sense. What's most important is always what's most important. In any given situation, when you don't have clarity, you don't have focus, you don't have direction, the first and foremost question is what's most important here? Whether you're talking about a decision, a specific decision, a specific meeting, a specific objective setting process, or anything along those lines. What is most important here? It's one of the finest questions you can ever ask to generate greater clarity and focus. You know, it's amazing we have to even say this one, but results, results are always worth multiples of any activity. And a lot of people don't get this one because they've got a list, a to-do list that would kill an elephant, but they don't have a clarity about what they're trying to accomplish. Results are always worth multiples of any activity. Any process is only useful in terms of the outcomes it produces. You know, we look at the most three most important questions. What's, what really matters? Why, does it, why is this the best choice and how do we get it done? Why is the most compelling point for engagement and alignment with people? If you can explain why you're making a choice, why it makes sense, why it's worthwhile, why you should do it, why this would move the action forward, it's more compelling and more engaging than anything else you could possibly offer. And finally, this is one of the statements that really makes sense for a lot of people in terms of how you design what would make a difference for people. Clarity of outcome and quality of process. Clarity of outcome, are we clear about what we're getting to? And do we have a process that's outstandingly efficient, effective, produces the most outstanding results? This should sound like common sense, which means we're in the right territory. So let me share with you a few decision-making process frameworks. And these are meant to achieve different levels of focus, impact, engagement, emotion, internal choice, external choice, and timeframes. So what you have here, you have seven different frameworks that can be mixed and matched in order to really get people to think differently about how they're making their decisions. Let's put some of these into, into place. And usually one of the problems with these particular frameworks is they're not really being used effectively. So if you talk on a metal level about the three levels of you could focus on, are we focusing on what we're doing? Or are we focusing on how we're thinking about something? Or are we focused on how we're being more effective and more consistent with what we really intend to be as an organization? And let's look at these from the point of view of leadership. One of the things I will say to you is while these are critically important for every leader of an organization, they're really very useful for leading your own life more effectively. So a lot of times we start thinking about what do we need to do? 
What do we need to do? I mean, that's the question that I hear so many organizations struggle with. What do we need to do? How do we prioritize? Well, you're starting in the wrong place. So let me show you what it really means to be in a place of effective level of focus. The foundation is what are we trying to be as your first level? Because if we know what we're trying to be, then we know how to think about what to do. But having a list of things to do will generally not give us an ability to think more clearly about what we're trying to be. So again, by building the platform in the appropriate way, and I want to just show you the difference. Most people's platforms are what's our to-do list. And I'm telling you, I find this with really talented executives. And they wonder why they're working so hard to get so little relative to their talent and their impact and their investment, because they're working on the wrong things. They're working on what do we need to do and then what do we what do we need to think about in addition to what we need to do. Absolutely backwards, cart before the horse in a consulting point of view. If we're clear about what we're trying to be as an organization, then we know how to think about what to do. So the level of focus that we start with and we start to evolve with is most critical for our ability to be highly effective in getting in more than anything else, getting your organization to focus. If your organization doesn't know what we're trying to be, they don't know how to think about what to do. And what you have then is a hierarchical system where the leaders have to address almost every major change priority set of actions. No responsibility, no accountability, no engagement. So this is your solution. Most effective approach to getting the focus right. Let's be clear about what we're trying to be. Another one, what's the level of impact we're trying to get to? So a lot of times we're always spending our time trying to get clear in order to be able to focus on what to make an impact so that we know how to create leverage in our organization. To me, leverage is the ability to create the environment and opportunities for other people to have an impact. So on one hand, these are four levels of impact, but we tend to spend most of our time on clarity where in reality, we need to invert the system. So our most fundamental thing is how do we create the environment and the opportunities for other people to have an impact? What would that impact best be? Good, how do we get them to focus on it? Can we be clear about that? So once again, you know, not only the levels of impact are important, but the structure for how we use them is critically important. So what we're doing here is establishing clear principles for how to think through a process of greater impact, value, and results. So let's just stop here for a moment, see if there's any questions, any thoughts. Are we being thought provoking here? Yes, Good, Steve. Steve. I, I, I love all this, you know me, I love frameworks. One of the things which I think would be helpful is maybe taking one of these frameworks and just giving us so, uh, like some case studies or examples or something, uh, you know, because I, I sort of get the concepts, but until I hear the stories, it's hard for me to understand them. That's a brilliant approach. If you give me about four more slides, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, how do we pull them together in some of the stories. But, you know, you're absolutely right. So, the, you know, I just want to really uh, engage you to think about how many different ways we can approach things where a lot of these fundamentals we're engaging with, but maybe not efficiently and effectively. So then we'll, we'll start to tie them together. These are just ones that you can use at any given point, Steve. A lot of these would make a difference. Just one of these could change how people address a particular issue. But when you start to pull them all together and we'll start to show you how the integration goes with the strategic alignment process. So thank you, Steve, I'll make sure I cover that. Anybody else? Let's dive in then, let's go a little bit more. So, you know, the issue of engagement is one of the biggest issues in an organization. And these are the four levels in which you really engage people. Do they love it? Do they want it? Do they need it? Do they have to do it? And most organizations are really, this is how we do it. What do we have to do? What do I need to do? How many times do we get to the level of want to do or love to do? And we're gonna to start to tie these together, which is where they get really, really exciting. Because when you can inter, uh, interact among these different ones, when you start to look at some of these really generate more of what we really wanna have, Here's the level we really want to work at. Your highest performing organizations, people are doing what they love to do and what they want to do. That's where you get real power with people. When they're fully engaged and they're fully committed, they love it or they want it. If they need to or they have to, you're going to get a far less effective level of engagement. So these are just laying out principles. And um, let's just do one more and then we'll start to get into 
the more fun. Emotions, and again, so how many organizations have you been around that drive on fear and uncertainty, which is basically our culture in the country today. Hopefully we're gonna get beyond that. But you know, again, what we're really trying to do, you can't really build to acceptance, embracing and delight on a basis of fear and uncertainty. So what do we need? We need to actually say, what's gonna delight us that we can embrace and accept? because that actually tends to diminish the doubt and uncertainty and fear. So once again, I mean, it's just sort of common sense that's not common practice. But if you want to engage people emotionally, and again, as a leader, your biggest job is to engage your people to be higher performers. We need to ask what will delight them that they can embrace and accept that tends to erase their doubt, their uncertainty and their fear. internal response. And this is where we start to build to what I call the strategic alignment. Too many organizations are built on rules. And then they have a lot of beliefs about what needs to be done and what they should value and who they are. But once again, this is a kind of platform of thinking and hierarchy of decision making that needs to be crushed. Because fundamentally, if we don't know who we are and what we value, our beliefs and our rules tend to be really convoluted. And I'll show you how we put this together. These are the internal choice. What do we focus on? What we have to do, what we believe is possible, what we value and who we are. The foundation of who we are and what we value is the most powerful we can have. So levels of external choice, really built on tactics and strategies. What do we need to do? What's my to-do list? What's our strategy for getting there? Okay, maybe that'll help us achieve our goals, but we're losing sight of our vision and mission. Once again, we need to crush this hierarchy and start to look at what's our vision and mission because that gives clarity to our goals and strategies and tactics. So Steve, to your point, let me bring that together now. So here's what we have. Let me give you an example of just my most recent example of a strategic alignment process. This is the structure and process for strategic alignment for leaders. So we had an organization that's a joint venture of two giant organizations in the healthcare field. And what they're trying to do is create a third entity because they bring clinical expertise and they bring technical expertise together trying to figure out what they can create. So let's just talk about, you know, the sense of who are they? You know, it's a base, basically a 5149 partnership of two multi-billion dollar companies. And the question is, why are they here? They couldn't figure that out yet. They've been in operation for about a year with not even a, a decision about their actual name. They were still being called the initials of their parents, JV followed by JV. So they didn't really have a clarity of purpose. They knew that they had assets to work with, but they didn't know quite what their purpose was. And again, they had spent a lot of meeting time trying to figure out why are we here? How do we leverage the assets of our clinical expertise and our technical expertise? So one of the things that they didn't have, they didn't have a clear sense of who they were. They didn't have a clear sense of their identity and they didn't have a clear sense of what to value. And again, they had a political battle going on between their parents who wanted them to produce something meaningful but different than what the parents could do. So what we had to do is build this foundation. Who could we be? And what do we need to value to be as most effective? Because that is really the platform for defining why we exist. And if you don't have a clarity of identity and values, it's a real good reason why you don't have a clarity of purpose. And you can't just make stuff up. I love these organizations that walk around and say, let's try out different purposes. But then they end up with these ungrounded decisions because they don't know really who they are, or what they value. And when I mean what they value, what are the values that we need to honor? Like for instance, this organization, I don't wanna give you the name, but I'll give you some of the fundamentals. Bold and decisive were two of their values because they had been run around for a year by the, the whims and the different ideas of their parents, but they needed to be able to make decisions rather than placate the parents. And by doing this, the parents were just absolutely amazed at the clarity of purpose that they came up with, which was creating access, global access to the best healthcare so that no one is left behind. Talk about a purpose, huh? Access to the best healthcare so no one's left behind. That's a purpose people could get behind and get engaged with. They didn't have that after a year of operation, but after a few days of process, which culminated in a one day, 10 hour meeting, they came up with that. And it was almost organic because we had the basis for what, who they were, who they needed to be as a joint venture, but not one of the parents, what they needed to value. 
and what they believed was possible given they could operate at their best. So then the mission became putting that into action and it was easy to come up with some goals. Now here's the interesting piece about goals. Doing it the normal way, I asked them to brainstorm what would be the best goals that would measure progress. And my definition of a goal is a measurement of progress of our mission, of accomplishment of our mission and vision. A measurement of progress in accomplishing our mission and vision. That's not a typical goal in the way people think about it, but it gives us a context that we can work in. So the typical way of doing it, they brainstormed and I asked them to send me their top three to four goals that they believe would be the ones to focus on for the organization. The 12 senior leaders supplied me with 42 options. Those were their best choices. <laughs> so you can only imagine a typical strategic planning session when you've got to deal with 42 options. But the way we dealt with it is it's either a triple A, an A, or we discard it. And what it came down to of the 42, there were about eight that really made the triple A. And then we started to say, which would really drive our organization consistent with our vision and mission? And in very short order, we had four that were overwhelming consensus among the group. And this was a two hour session. Can you imagine how long it would take if we had a normal strategic planning session where we just put everything on the table and started, you know, basically cattle trading? Well, I think this is more important in advocating for their particular ideas. So what we got a chance to do was to actually build consensus by a process that made sense. Because if we have our purpose and our vision, if we understand our mission because we understand these underlying factors, then coming up with the goals was literally a two hour process with a little bit of time put in in front of it. And the time put in front of it was as much to demonstrate they didn't know what they were doing as to help them get all their ideas out so we could really distill them quickly. So I call this the best process for distilling be best thinking quickly. Steve, that's one story. You want a few more? Yeah, can you, and especially like the, the other pyramids that you had. Right. Uh, I mean, so I, I, I like everything that you just said here mm -hmm. in terms of the, the goals being all about uh, fulfilling on your mission. And, uh, right. you know, so I'd love to just see how all of this fits together with the other frameworks or at least one framework oh, just sure. to help pull it together. <laughs> well, let's, let's pull up some of these here. So let's talk about, um, let me see what we got here. Let's, let's pull one. So let's talk about uh, levels of emotion. So how do we engage emotion? So what we're really looking for in emotion is we're looking for what would delight people, what would they embrace? So let me just give you the context. This was a 10 hour Zoom meeting. And we had people from Amsterdam, Boston, Cleveland, Seattle and San Francisco among their 12 executives. So we had people starting very early and starting, and starting very late and staying late. What Steve, we, are you sharing the right slide? Well, I, I'm just tell, talking about the emotion. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna use it in the context of this strategic alignment for leadership decision-making. We're talking about how we add emotion Let's talk about the emotions we want. Delighting and embracing um, are two of the most important uh, emotions that we want to generate for people to get emotionally engaged. Do you think strategies emotionally delight people? Do you think goals emotionally delight people? But a clarity of purpose and a vision that matters is what people really gravitate to. It gives them a tremendous amount of emotional connection which is where you get your best engagement with people. You want the intellectual engagement, but that's one piece. Let's talk about levels of engagement too, because the worst way to do it is you have to do this. You have to do these strategies. So I'm your boss now. We take these brilliant strategies and goals we came up with. Now I want you to start executing on them. So is that something that you're gonna love to do or want to do? So that's how you engage people. It's by having them love it and want it. What do they really love and want most? A sense of purpose and a mission and goals that make sense consistent with that. So once again, when you want the level of emotion to go up, you want the level of engagement to go up, you want the level of impact to go up, where do you get the greatest leverage and impact in your organization when you have people driving clearly towards the purpose and mission that they understand? Because if all they're doing is executing a set of strategies, there's very little impact or leverage that you're gonna get. You're gonna get incremental improvement. So is this making sense in terms of some of these other decision-making processes that we talked about? What you want is for people to be in love with what they're doing. They want to do it. They need to have a 
sense of making an impact. How do they know they're making an impact? They're taking responsibility for designing strategies consistent with the goals and the mission and the vision of the organization. Too many leaders are involved in tactics and strategies. And I basically say the leader owns the vision, the mission, and is a participant with the goals. They need to ensure the goals are clear. Your people should own the strategies and tactics. Susan. Don't you think that's because when you can align what their mission and goal is and vision for their life, mm -hmm. how they can see that that becomes integral to the success of what they're doing. Absolutely. Well, that's people want to know why they're doing something. Yeah. You know, there's a great exercise if you want to see it. This is one, you know, because people I'm, I'm giving you a proposition. And today was really built around what are the principles. So I'm delighted to share tons of stories because when I, you know, normally when we don't have such a uh, really elite group, you need to have a lot of stories to keep them engaged. <laughs> but here's a really a demonstration of the reason why is so important and most people don't really understand that a lot of leaders don't get that why people are doing something is the most engaging emotionally fulfilling level so work with me here for a moment raise your hand as high as you can come on steve now raise it higher okay what's wrong with the first request see people will never give you a hundred percent even if they're willing to comply They'll never give you 100% until they understand why you're asking them to do something. And if I didn't tell you why, even though you like me and you're willing to comply and you're engaged, I'll never get 100%. And from a leadership point of view, I want the maximum engagement, participation, emotional involvement I can possibly get. So I need to have a clarity of purpose and a clarity of mission that makes sense and engages people. It gives them passion for the vision and the mission. It makes them want to engage or love to engage on behalf of the organization. Because otherwise, giving them goals and strategies, a performance sheet, a to-do list, I mean, at best, I'm gonna get compliance. If I can't explain why I'm asking you to do it, I'm not gonna get your best. And that means we got a lot of extra effort going into minimal, minimal improvement. So that's not what we're aiming for as leaders. We're aiming for maximum impact with minimum engagement. And the best way to do that is to make sure we understand the hierarchy of impact, the hierarchy of decision-making upon which, if, I, if you understand why we're doing what we're doing and what we're doing, how we're doing it becomes a very, very quick thing. I ask a lot of leaders, where do you spend the most time on your vision, your mission, your goals, your strategies? This is a pretty sophisticated group. What's the answer? Strategies, isn't it? Now that's really backwards, isn't it? Because this is the least important of the four most important decisions that need to be made. And the reason that you spend so much time on strategies is often because there's no clarity about what the ultimate goal is. And even if there's some clarity about the goal, there's no clarity about why that's the best choice. So we're constantly hedging our bets as to what the strategy is. And we're basically negotiating. I don't like your strategy. I wanna do my strategy because I think it makes more sense given the goal that I think makes more sense, which often is what maximizes my compensation, not what maximizes the impact of the organization. So if they don't understand why we're doing what we're doing first and foremost, it's hard to choose what would make the biggest difference. And then we're gonna spend all our time trying to figure out how to achieve something we just made up because it made no sense. And that's what most strategic planning looks like today. We spend our time trying to figure out how we're gonna implement a strategy to achieve a goal that we made up that doesn't have rationale, congruence, or alignment with our mission and our vision. Makes no sense, but it doesn't mean it's not the common practice. Is that helpful? Yeah. So let's Steve, look at I, a couple other quick can decisions. I ask just a, can yeah, I ask just ahead. a quick question? So I know Please. when you and I have talked, you said one of the things that you're able to do is I, I can't remember the duration, but basically within 24 hours or one eight hour meeting, you yeah. pretty much will guarantee 100% alignment of a leadership team behind the values, uh, the mission, the purpose, right. vision, and all those types. Can you share without giving away your secret sauce, how do you get that level of alignment? I mean, it's it's nice to say we need to have a purpose for us. We need to have a mission. mission. It's another thing to actually get people to figure out what it is. Could you share a little bit of your yeah, process for that? Absolutely. So first of all, the important piece is these are the fundamentals that we build on the internal decisions because these exist whether or not we've chosen them consciously or not. 
As human beings, our identity, values, beliefs, and rules are wired in our nervous system. They are there. They were probably picked when you were very, very young, usually between the ages of three and seven. Many of them don't make any sense today. It doesn't mean you can't change them consciously, but most people don't. In the context of an organization, who we are and what we value and what we believe we need to do and what our rules of engagement are, are often unconscious. But we kind of think, well, I could do this, but I can't do that. I think what's really important here, what this company values, what my boss values is this or that. I don't know for sure, so I'm making it up. Guess what happens when you get an organization, even as small as 30 people, making up their sense of identity, values, beliefs, and rules. You've got incoherence, misalignment, and no ability to bring it together because we're not having the conversation to begin with. So what happens by having the conversation, who are we as an organization? What do we value in order to be our best? And what do we, what could, what do we believe is possible when we operate at our best? We're building a foundation of conscious choice. That foundation of conscious choice is usually one of the most engaging, uplifting, emotionally uh, thrilling kinds of sets of decisions we could ever make because they're fundamental to our ability to function, to build a culture of consciousness and coherence. And what happens when we don't have that is we're kind of meandering around. And most people don't know. Nobody's been taught this process, have they? We all know it's important to know who we are, what we value, what we believe is possible in our rules. We all want to have a sense of purpose, mission, goals, and strategies. But nobody's really, I don't know anybody else who's studied decision making who says, here's a structure for how to make these decisions quickly and simply. Because nobody I've worked with, and that would be about 84 companies at this point we've done this process with, has ever had a process this simple, this coherent, this agreeable. So what happens, Steve, is the process that we take them through is as important as the outcomes we're trying to produce here. And I call it distillation of best thinking. So one of the fundamentals of that without getting into the details of it is when you work in small groups, you break, let's say a team of a senior executive team of 12 people. I've done it with a team in one day as large as 62 people and as small as six people. But typically the more people, the merrier up to maybe 10 to 20. Those are really good numbers because you get a lot of input then. But what happens is you break them into small groups and you ask for the, first of all, the distillation of best thinking. Let me share that with everybody. You're welcome to use it. So what I ask is, and the clarity of the question is what's most important. So I ask a question. So let's talk about values. The first place we start, I call it the most accessible level of, of um, innovation and acceleration. So the question is what's most important for us to value, to honor, to be in order to be our best? You know, creativity, innovation, contribution, uh, communication, collaboration, whatever it is. So what happens is I give them a minute and a half to write their best bullet points. We break them into small groups of three to four. Then I ask that small group to come up with their best three points from the group of three or four. So guess what? In a, in a real facilitation point of view, it's a lot harder to control a small group than a large group. Because if there's a group of 12 executives and somebody has the floor, half the people are tuned them out because they're just bombastic. In a small group of three or four, I need your vote in order to get my point of view across. So I'm gonna be a lot nicer and a lot more collaborative. So literally in 10 minutes or less, they can come up with their top three or four. And then we bring the, let's say three groups together and we look at their charts. Typically 30 to 50% of their answers are the same across three groups that operated independently. So instead of three times four, a dozen choices, we're usually down to six to nine. And then we simply, you know, what I find is that 90% of the time, the top two have a consensus immediately in that point of view. And most of those processes take anywhere from 30 minutes. The hardest one is actually identity. That often takes 75 minutes total processing from individual to small group to large group. So that's the quality of the process, which is critical to make sure it works. The outcome is clear. I know exactly what I'm asking for. I know exactly how to ask the question. The question you use is instrumental in getting the answers that are worthwhile. So you got to really work your questions well, then you've got to use a process that's going to distill it quickly. And I teach people how to use this because most decision making sucks. I mean, that's just the basis of it. And what we're doing is giving them what I call the distillation of best thinking quickly process because we do it seven times in order to get these answers. 
So what I guarantee is clarity of identity values and beliefs that would uplift the company, engage the company, stimulate people's excitement, and also to make the decisions of purpose, mission, and vision minimally. And if need be, we'll have a, a separate up to two hour session and we'll get the goals, absolutely get the goals. In most large organizations, I tend to have the goal setting separate because they need some time to really think about what the appropriate, proper and appropriate measurements would be. So again, clarity of outcome, quality of process, knowing what I want to achieve, which is engagement, emotional connection, critical for the process. Is that helpful? And so I, I can guarantee them now, if we're in person, it's usually eight hours. On Zoom, it took 10 hours because you need a lot of breaks, but it's basically eight hours of processing. But here's the point, more importantly than anything else, it's such a powerfully engaging process. It's such an uplifting process. I haven't any, uh, heard anybody say, we had the most stimulating strategic planning process you've ever seen. We had such a great time. I'll tell you what, everybody said that at the end of the session, because I always wrap it up with the same thing we're going to wrap up here, which what are the best lessons and best points you're going to take away and work on. And everybody said, I can't believe we work together so well. I can't believe we're so energized. I can't believe we're so clear. I can't believe our path is that obvious. And I can't believe we did this for this long. And I'm still so excited about what we're doing. I've never heard that coming out of a strategic planning session. <laughs> So, you know, again, um, clarity of outcome, quality of process built on fundamental principles that give you a perspective that are principle based usually is a pretty good way to go. Any other questions or thoughts? Great question. I mean, that's a wonderful question and it's worthy to have a good answer. Is that a sufficient answer for you? Good. We can go into depth on that in another conversation too. So here's another way in which to shift people's thinking. And again, you know, we start to do the strategic alignment process. You know, my first question is we talking about a vision for the year, a vision for three years, a vision for five or 10. When I first started in business, people used to write 20 year business plans. Now, I'm not that old, but I'm older. <laughs> you know, today you would be called insane for even thinking 10 years. The last time I heard somebody working on a 10 year vision was 20 years ago in the year 2000. And that was a very visionary leader. But today, the typical vision for the future long-term is considered three years. That's far enough to be able to be unable to be totally clear, but close enough to have some coherence that we could make. So generally the vision, the long-term vision today is three years. Isn't that amazing? So when I started doing this, it was 20 years. And then we bucked up to 10 years and then we we're down to five. <laughs> and it was about seven or eight years ago, we started making three years was our time frame. But if you look at the time frame, if you ask most people what's on your mind, it's their to-do list. And if they're really good, it's the to-do list for the week. The really smart ones are thinking about what do we need to do this month or quarter? Or where are we thinking in three years? The biggest issue I see with leaders that helps them to be far more effective when I first meet them and when I first to meet them. So this is how most people are operating. We think about where we want to be in 10 years or a generation of our organization in three years. We're usually starting with what do we need to do today and this week? Reality, we need to be thinking long-term and then we back into what needs to be done today. It's the only way you're going to clarify your to-do list in a coherent consensus way is to figure out is what we're doing today really going to serve what we need to accomplish this quarter, the next three years, the next 10 years. You don't start from the future and work backwards. You're probably doing a lot of activity that doesn't matter, has little value and won't make a difference. I basically think that's a waste of time and effort. And a lot of times we're talking about highly paid and very talented people wasting 30 to 70% of their time and effort. I think that's a horrible thing to do. So again, best level of time frame. what's the longest time frame we can start then we back into what we need to do today and this week. So let's test it out. Let's see, you had some really good questions already, but let's take a look at somebody who's got an important decision to make or an opportunity you want to work on. Anything in particular that comes up? We'll talk about how we can use some of these frameworks. No tough decisions to make or opportunities you want to take advantage of? So let me offer you another one. You know, I think all of you are part of the, uh, you know, the C-suite uh, executive level. You know, one of the questions we're asking is, what's your word for this year? 
Let's talk about that and see if we can refine how you came to that just using some of these very simple decision-making frameworks. Anybody got a word for the year? Alignment on my end. Alignment, okay. Yeah. So what's the outcome there? What's the most important result of doing that, Eris? So right now I feel like we've got, I've got close to 20 people right now on my team and everybody seems to be going in their own direction. One guy's working on cybersecurity. The other guy's doing cloud services. Right. Uh, we've got a VoIP solution. We've got all these different verticals because we service all different sectors. And so my problem is an alignment on our goals uh, and mission vision. So we obviously know we want to hit seven and a half million, eight million dollars next year. We want to you know, reduce, or should I say, improve efficiencies and also get a better level of support on our team. Um, and right now I feel like everyone's got their own little agenda and there's no unified, because everyone's claiming that their, their silo is unique to the other guy's silo and we don't have a, you know, sort of like every, nobody, the entire team is not on one train. Everyone's on their own little train track. Right. And you know what's missing? Mm. Let's just use this as a model of what's missing. So what you've given me is some goals that you've made up. Yep. You give me some strategies. Alignment is really in a strategy. Yeah. So the, if you get alignment, I ask, what would that accomplish? And you gave me a couple of goals, better performance, hit our target of seven and a half million. The missing answer, which is the most fundamental piece that allows everybody to get on the same page is why does that make any sense? Purpose. Yeah, but what's the purpose of doing that? Why would I care versus I'm getting paid for maximizing my revenues? So you begin to see what's missing. When you look at a situation, and this is, thank you for the example and thank you for the candor. What you begin to see is that if you're missing elements, your decision-making is going to have holes in it, if not massive gaps. And the massive gap here is tell me why I should care about your seven and a half million dollars. Tell me why I'm doing what I'm doing and I shouldn't be able to uh, do it my way instead of the other guy who's got a totally different practice. I don't see the mission that sells us we're on the same team. I see the mission that I've got objectives to achieve and I need to put in place strategies to achieve those objectives because I don't see any higher calling than those objectives. And in order to build a team that's gonna be sustainably able to grow, I need to have a clarity of vision about what we're going to be so I can really engage around what I want to be instead of what I want to do. So again, what you start to see is where the holes in the decision-making and it allows you to say, okay, we need a clarity of vision, but it also generally would say, we've got an inadequacy about really having a coherent agreement about what our values are. And probably we don't even have a belief about what we really want to be or could be. So again, I mean, there, there's your gaps to be filled. Those are the bridges to cross. If you build those bridges, who are we as an organization? I think I'm a security guy. Why do I need to care about the, the rest of these folks? Yeah. We don't have an identity as a coherent organization. So then therefore, let me build my identity as the piece that I know how to be and do. Make sense? Yeah, it's you been begin to see problem. how all these pieces play together and when they're well integrated, the power is in the integration. The ultimate power is in the integration. And that's the piece that really makes the biggest difference. And identifying these processes, when we go through it, I find that, as you were mentioning before about getting the executive team, so getting the four or five executives mm -hmm. have a team I find it's easier to get buy-in on that because they're all like, yeah, yeah, of course, we're here to do this. We're here to deliver best value. We're here to, you know, grow and become one of the best IT firms in the country or, you know, bring back to our community. And then when you distill it down to, you know, mid-level or below that, you know, which right now we just really have myself, three mid-level managers, and then I have the staff team. Right. It, when you get down to that one level below, the buy-in is sometimes very difficult. They all nod their head in the meeting and you try to get them to get involved and some will, some won't. I find that long-term buy-in or um, adoption of sort of even coming up with that mission vision right. um, has been a lot more difficult than when you talked about before with the senior management. I find that 
they're usually more receptive to saying, yes, we'll buy in versus the guy doing help desk. Well, so what you find, uh, let me go back. I'm just playing with these different ones. What you find is that you've got a hierarchical organization right now is what you're explaining to me. And your people below you like you enough, respect you enough, or are afraid of you enough to say yes to you without giving you the honest feedback. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I want to say respect me because I, I really am not a tyrant of a boss. So no, but that's why I said it could be one of those three. It's likely to be yeah. one of those three. The reason they're saying yes without really giving you full commitment is they trust you enough, they like you enough, they respect you enough, or they fear you enough to say, well, whatever the boss says. Right. But what you've got then is you've got less engagement of your people. Let's talk about what engages them. Uh, really being on purpose with a mission and goals that make sense together rather than saying, okay, I, I see Era's goals and I understand the strategies that I'm responsible for. Let me just go do what I'm doing. But doing what you're doing doesn't engage them at the level of saying, I am a meaningful part of this organization. I am valued. I believe I can grow here. I don't see that path. What I do see is I got a, a bunch of things to do here. And that's... And, and uh, then that's so worth like in the organization because they're probably doing things they like, but they're not necessarily in love with where they are and what the organization is. They like you enough, they respect you enough, and or they fear you enough to go, well, you know, it's good so far. So, so getting through some of these things, and I find it very challenging sometimes in these in the technology sector because it seems like it's always a cliche. Mm -hmm. going through some of these identities and purpose mission vision um it seems to be very cliche almost a rinse and repeat when you go through the exercise we brought in a coach mm -hmm. for four days um to help identify it we went to the rockefeller methods we we you know created our spreadsheets and we you know tiered all of our 30 60 90 day actionable items and everything and then we tried to distill it down to everybody and again the buy-in was pretty horrid uh it, it you know the people drank the kool-aid for 60 90 uh, six months for let's say 180 days and then things slipped back to reality and so what we did is we've been rebuilding our infrastructure from the bottom up or should i say on your sheet the bottom up so we've been building rules and strategies and moving our way backwards uh on your flow process here versus identifying our purpose and identity because right. there were insufficient rules and strategies around things. Yeah, but again, you, you can't build a clarity of identity based on rules and beliefs. Right. It doesn't work, but you can build rules and beliefs that make sense if you're clear about who you are and what's most important in the organization. It's easy to define goals and strategies, and four days is a death march for most people. I'm not sure how much excitement you had, how much love and want to continue to do that you had at day two and three and four. You know, yeah, no. capacity. You know, again, yeah, we're at either they're engaged and they're loving it, because if they're not loving it and wanting more of it, you have got them disengaged. And if they're disengaged, they're going to go along with whatever comes up. And if they're going along with whatever comes up, their level of commitment is far reduced. And if the level of commitment's reduced, the level of sustainability is reduced. I mean, again, what you got is a process that follows certain set of principles. It is or it isn't, it's working or it's not working. And you can check many of these. So let's just look at some of these to say, what would it be? How much clarity and focus do they really have that would make an impact and create leverage? We're trying to get clear about what to focus on, but we didn't start out by saying, where do we create the opportunity and the environment for other people to make an impact? Now come to us with what you think would be the best focus and let's consolidate that together. Let's talk about what our time frame is. We probably built a time frame based on quarters rather than a 10 year, three year, and then back into the quarter. Correct. So what happens is you're also working on what are our rules and beliefs rather than who are we and what do we value so that we have rules and beliefs that are congruent with us being our best at all times. We probably had tactics and strategies instead of a vision and mission that would allow us to come up with goals that people would say, I know why we're doing that and I know how to get that done. And I'm enthusiastic about it. And having tracking methodology doesn't necessarily produce what you really want is they're delighted and embrace it 
they love to do what they need to do. They want to do it and they know who they're trying to be. So they know how to think about what they're doing. We're trying to figure out what they need to do so that they're thinking about what to do more consistently. So you see that what happens is that's pretty typical of how most humans work and how most organizations function because there's no process to bring them together. Mm. Lacking a coherent, fundamentally principle-based process, we tend to do things a little backwards. So, Steve, limited. Yes, Steve. Don't don't you think that um, if you were working with a frontline person, like in the example before, someone on a help desk? Mm -hmm. Um, trying to um, discuss with them uh, three years or more, three years or 10 years or lifetime um, is, um, is, is a fruitless exercise. No. Uh, you know, a frontline person is thinking of, you know, how many calls they're going to get during, how many customers they need to deal with during the day. And they're going to be thinking about their quarterly numbers and their yearly bonus. Um, I'm not... I'm, I'm much, I'm, I hear everything you're saying, and I would keep, I would keep this to um, a certain seniority of management. Well, I think you'd make a mistake then. So let me give you a perfect example. I was one expecting one you to say that, and that's why I asked the question. <laughs> so one of my clients ran an operations center for one of the world's largest insurance companies. And back in the day when we worked there, there were 400 people, 400 people in an office whose job it was to open envelopes and post the checks to the correct account. And they processed on average $2 billion in checks a year. Can you imagine a more deadening job ever? Their turnover when we first, when my, my client took over as the head of this operation, their turnover was somewhere a range of 60%. And that's costly because if you gotta get it right or else you got all this other customer service issue. Can you imagine opening envelopes, taking checks out, that was back in the days of the flashing GUI. So, you know, talk about a dead end job. So here's what happens. We started to look at who are we and what would be a purpose that would get people engaged, even in a job role that most of us would never try, never try. <laughs> but people needed checks. They needed a job. They needed to work and they were willing to work. So here's what we came up with. Our identity was we're the best in the industry. The insurance industry is huge. And our purpose is to be the best team in the industry. And they had three straight years of winning what's called the Dalbar Awards as the best team in operations in the insurance industry. And our values was excellence. And, you know, we went on from there, you know, in terms of values. And we shared this with a team of 400. We came up with it with the senior management, the senior VP and his direct, you know, line people who ran the organization. So we went over the next year, we reduced turnover from 60% to 11%. That's a pretty significant win. And over the next three years, at the end of three years, the turnover rate was 8%. That's an astounding process. And what did they do? The same job they always did. They took checks out of envelopes and posted it to the computer. But they were part of the best team in the industry. Their purpose was to be the best always and to make sure their team continued to be the best. Their values were excellence, creativity, contribution, connection, collaboration. So they started to work as a team rather than I can't, you want me to help you with your checks? I got enough of my own here. I got a stack like this today. So they changed their whole sense of who they were. They changed their values. They changed what they believed was possible in the job. It wasn't taking checks out of an envelope and putting them in the computer. It was to be part of the best team in the industry. And that gave them a sense of purpose and a mission where the goals made sense to them. It's one of the most amazing stories of success that I know because talk about the most mundane front level workers doing one of the most mundane tasks ever and transforming the culture in under a year and having a three year run winning the Dalbar Awards, which is a very difficult thing to do actually. But that's how outstanding they were. Of course, the competition sucked because the competition was the same as them, taking envelopes out of checks, feeding it into computers. Who would want to do that? But if I'm part of something that matters more, if I have a clearer sense of purpose and identity, I'm willing to engage at a level most people never would. So no, I would share it, Steve. But I don't start I, there. I don't start there. you got to have a coherence of the whole thing. 
who are we? Why are we here? What do we value? What's our mission? What do we believe is possible if we fulfill in our, our identity and values? What would be goals that would be consistent with our vision and our mission? Now you've got a coherence that most people, even people whose job is to take envelope, take checks out of envelopes, would appreciate and respect and understand. But imagine when you're talking about knowledge workers, people who really basically love the kind of work that they do, but don't have a connection to their purpose and mission, don't have a vision, don't have a sense of identity beyond, hey, I'm pretty good at what I do, don't have a clarity of values other than what they hold themselves to. We miss a tremendous amount of engagement. We miss a tremendous amount of emotional uh, engagement. We miss a tremendous amount of opportunity to help them bring out the best because they're so excited about who they are, where they are, and what they're doing, because it makes sense in terms of what really matters and why it matters. I mean, it's amazing how consistently this kind of process drives extraordinary performance at every level of an organization. So again, you wouldn't just share, hey, here's our vision. <laughs> but it needs to have a coherence and the coherence is so powerful that it naturally evolves and people find their own sense of, okay, I'm gonna do better because I wanna be a part of this team. Make sense, common sense? Yeah, um, I have another question. Um, I'm not quite sure if I understand um, the values box mm -hmm. and the, uh, was it the beliefs box? Um, yeah, the values and the, the beliefs. And I'll just give you a little bit more context. Um, and I know this coming from it backwards, but if I have, if I have a client that I want to work this through and I'm, this is hypothetical, um, and there's, uh, because it's coming up a lot, I anticipate it coming up a lot that wants that. Uh, wants to incorporate diversity um, and wants to incorporate sustainability in their overall company principles. Right. You know, but it's not a goal or a strategy. It's not directly related to their products necessarily, but they want to know that the way they operate internally uh, and how their products would actually help their customers, if it's possible, they want overlap with diversity and sustainability. So where where do those phrases and expressions come up within your uh, framework? Well, see, you're actually doing something really important here because you're asking the question. And I'm, I'm now I'm gonna have to share again because I wanna show you something here. So I bring this up because you're asking the question, they want to do diversity inclusion. So is that a belief about what would be good to do or is that a true value that they're honoring? Mm. And again, it's not one or the other. It is one or the other. It is how they approach it. Is that part of their strategy or is that a goal or is that part of their mission? Because depending on how they approach this, it has a totally different impact and it has a totally different likelihood of success and sustainability. So is that consistent with their mission to be the best organization representing? And I say that because one of my clients is one of the examples of really walking the talk of diversity inclusion is at the heart of everything they do because they feel like, and why is it? Because it's consistent with their identity. Our, we are representatives and servants of our community. And we, are, we need to value looking like our community, we wanna have congruence is one of their values. We wanna have connection to our community. So for them, it's very much embedded with their purpose and their mission to be honoring diversity and inclusion. Oh, by the way, it's the most diverse executive team. This is one of the largest financial institutions in the, in the Eastern seaboard here. And um, they have the most diverse board of directors in the financial in industry, including a uh, black woman as their lead board of directors. They have a totally diverse board. I think it's majority women and half those women are actually women of color. They have, I mean, it's just an extraordinary operation and they're a super high performing organization, but it's built into who they are. It's built into their values. It's not something they believe they should do. And if they, it's a should do, it's a rule. We have to do more diversity and inclusion. Good luck. 
there is, this goes back to your point. Do I have to do this? Then you're making up rules for me. If I believe this is part of who we are and what we value, I own it. Does that help you? Is that helpful, Steve? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So really, I mean, where are we approaching this from? I actually have a question and I've done this with, um, with the EQ side of things where mm -hmm. there's like an emotional wheel right. and it helps identify that. Is there sort of a, cause I'm actually searching right now as I'm going through this, like the uh, business identity wheel or something like that. And then a, a goal wheel so that we can kind of, or, and then we can kind of do like a distill of this information so that, you know, um, when I go through this exercise, I find that the questions sometimes are so open-ended and then as you're drilling me up, so like, or, or just in case now I'm point where being more diverse, well, is diverse really a goal or is that an objective? Like, these are all the different things that sometimes people throw all this stuff out there, you know, being experts and community and all these, you know, fancy words. Some people actually love to throw all these mission, vision, purpose and use the, the jargon. Um, but then the question is now, where do you distill it down to? And so is there like a tool or multiple sort of simple things to be done to sort of help distill it down into these silos so that it's yeah. clearer or easier to identify? Well, the best tool that we have for doing this is the book that's at the editor right now. <laughs> so when do I get my first copy? I want to sign one too. <laughs> Pre-order on Amazon. What's the link? Well, it hasn't even gone up on Amazon yet. It'll be up there in March. There but, you go. Uh, so here's the thing. Soon enough. Really clear with you. I mean, part of the problem is you can make up all the stuff you want, but if it doesn't have a coherence of process, so we start with what we value and who we are. These are the two most fundamental levers of engagement, of emotional content, of impact. So we need to start here. We can't just start with, okay, what do we need to do? We need to have more diversity and inclusion. We need to have more participation. We need to have more engagement. Is that, is that one of our values or identity? The process is as critical as the outcome. So the questions that you need to ask in your organization need to be customized for that specific. I mean, the que questions that I use, which are in the book, which I'm happy to share with you, um, are pretty consistent, but then are customized for the specific situation based on who we're dealing with. So Steve, to your point, our frontline questions would be slightly nuanced differently than our senior executive level questions would be. And if we're bringing together a cross section of the organization, which we often suggest doing, then we have to really think about how do we ask the question in a way that people don't feel like they're out of their comfort zone. But Eris, to your point here, we start with identity and values. Then we start to talk about our purpose. Then we go to our vision, which is the confluence of identity, purpose, and values taken into the future. Once we have those four points, everything flows at a speed you can't believe. But if we start with, okay, so what are our goals this year? You'll never get that coherence in that simple a way of organizing it. So yes, there's process to it, but you start with, okay, who are we? What do we value? What do we believe is possible? So given who we are, given what we value, that's how purpose shows up. Given what we value and what we believe is possible in consistent alignment with our vision and purpose, that's how mission shows up. Given what we believe is possible and in alignment with our purpose and our mission, what are the most important goals? So everything is built together. It's an iterative process. So you can go back at some point a lot of times when we're working on beliefs, it starts to affect how we think about our identity. Because in the conversation about what do we believe is possible when we operate at our best, we're going to get some new ideas about who we really are or could be. Does that make sense? So without really taking a specific situation, you know, the questions really, here's the biggest piece that I think you're missing in this when you ask that question is, given who we are and what we value is how purpose shows up. So if we I did, I'm not identity, following. If you don't have clarity of identity and values, you won't have clarity of purpose. When you see an organization that doesn't have clarity of purpose, whether you're talking about the biggest companies on the planet and their supposed purpose and, and vision statements, I'm going to tell you right now what's missing, whether they have a weak identity or a weak set of values, whether it's marketing jargon talk 
not really values, but you know, hey, we got our marketing thing. Well, that tells us why we're here. Doesn't really work. So that's the problem here. So if we're clear about who we are as an organization, if we're clear about what we value in order to be our best as an organization, then we can ask the question, given who we are, fill in the blank with those particular terms, given what we value, fill in the blank with those specific values, why are we here is actually a question that it's incredibly fast to answer. If you get the identity and values clear, purpose comes up in usually 30 to 40 minutes of conversation and processing. But once again, I want to really focus you on the power of process is as critical as the outcome that we're trying to get to. And the process requires a really specific question that would be worthy of being answered and the way in which it's processed and the way it's which it processed. So again, individual work to small team work to the large group conversation distilling the best thinking all the way up.